book of Colossians in chapter 4 says this, beginning in verse 2. It says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word. To speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your gracious word, the opportunity to be gathered together in this place tonight. Father, thank you for the truth that is set before us. Lord, as we're really just studying tonight how to share our faith without fear, Lord, without antagonism, just giving people an opportunity to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you help us to be your obedient servants? Thank you, Lord, for the way that you have blessed us so in this church. Lord, we were blessed this morning to be encouraged by this fellowship as they remembered the 10 years that Mary and I have served here. Lord, we're blessed with the gift of music that you've given to us and people that can sing. And my heart was encouraged to see the young people involved in the service in that way this morning. Father, we're encouraged as we're reminded again tonight of two families in our church that this week knew the joy of seeing new life come into their homes with the birth of two daughters. Father, we... We thank you for those lives. We pray you give great wisdom to the moms and dads and families involved to raise these little girls to be champions for Jesus Christ. Lord, bring them to the place where they will know and love you, we pray. Lord, we pray for our church that we would have a heart for young people. This would be a place, Lord, for young families to come and raise their children, to know that they're going to come and hear your word week by week. Lord, they're going to be encouraged to walk by faith. We look forward to next Sunday as we celebrate Father's Day. Lord, make that a great day for our families as we come, Lord, to share here in the morning and then Sunday evening, Father, with the the film that we'll be showing here. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you bless those times together. Now, Lord, draw our attention towards your truth tonight, the glorious truth, even though it makes us uncomfortable at times, that we are to be sharing our faith with those that are in our walk in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Just highlight again, this is our third week uh, in this study, and uh, just remind you, we've lost our overhead PowerPoint tonight. And I put a few copies here on the table. There's some back there at the door on that little music stand. If uh, you need a copy of the outline that we're following, you don't have one with you, please go ahead and grab one of those. We've been talking about how that if we're going to share faith, first it must be rooted in prayer. All good things come out of prayer. Coming to the Lord, seeking his face, seeking his power, asking God to open a door of opportunity for us to be able to have the chance to share our faith with others. It might be in a restaurant. It might be sitting on a bench in a park. It might be sitting down by the the, the river, walking on the trail. It might be at work, but somewhere you need to be looking. God will have an opportunity for you to speak up and have the chance uh, chance to introduce somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, pray that God would open to us a door for what? Not for our glorious testimony. A door for the word. That's what God has promised to bless. Not wrong to share your testimony, but somewhere along the way, you've got to bring the word into the conversation and share with them the truths of the scriptures. We're going to be talking about that specifically this evening. And he says to speak the mystery of Christ, and he says to make it manifest. The idea there is make it clear. We want people to clearly understand what this gospel is, what Jesus has done for them, and how they need him as their savior. 
And he says we ought to walk with wisdom, especially to the words those that are without, those that are outside of Christ, that don't know what we have been blessed to know. We sang tonight, Blessed Assurance. Do you feel blessed? Are we blessed to have that assurance in our hearts that our sins are forgiven, Christ is our Savior, heaven is our home? We ought to, ought to feel blessed mightily by what God has done for us. And let our speech, he says, be seasoned with salt, with grace. We ought to be gracious with others. Last Sunday night, we talked about being followers of Christ. Our, if I, I asked the question last Sunday, how many of you feel you, you are a follower of Christ? Well, Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, the first four people they called, follow me. And I will make you something. What was that? I'll make you fishers of men. Soul winners. People that have an eye for and a vision for and a burden for those that are outside of Jesus Christ. To bring them to the place where they are in Christ. Where their sins are forgiven. And Christ is their Savior. And so we spent some time talking about that. We've talked about prayer. We've, we've talked about having that passion for Christ. The boldness to share our faith. That needs to be prayed for. We talked about the fact we're in a partnership. And in that partnership, we're just a voice. We're like John the Baptist. I'm just a voice. He that comes after me, he's so much greater than me. I'm just a voice. I must what? I must decrease and he must increase. You know, that's a good goal when you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. For you to become less and less and him to become what? More and more. That he becomes the focus of your conversation as you share him with others. It needs to be in the power of the Spirit of God. He's, he's the one you're partnering with. He's the one that God has sent into the world to be the convictor of sin and the convincer of the righteousness that's available in Christ Jesus and the need of that righteousness. You don't need to do it. You don't need to do it in your own power. It's what? It's Christ in you, working in you, using you in the lives of others. In learning to share your faith without fear, we said there are five questions that are so vital and so important that you need to, to be addressing continually as you uh, want to share Christ. And we said the first question is one that's intended not to be in people's faces, not to turn people away. And I suggest that you don't ask people, do you believe in God and things like that. Start off with this. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? And then what's your job? Listen. <laughs> Just listen. Let them talk. Everybody thinks they're spiritual. And it doesn't matter what they... You can talk to somebody who's a witch. You can talk to somebody who's a Buddhist. You can talk to somebody who's a Muslim. Just let them tell you what they believe. Let them share that. But always be looking for ways to what? To turn that conversation to Christ. We, we talked to you about the word salt, and, and the S in salt just means what? Say something. Your only sin is your sin of silence. When you don't say anything. God can use you in your simplicity and in all of your weakness. But God can't use your silence when you don't say anything to people. You don't even begin to ask the questions. So pray for boldness. It's going to be awkward the first few times when you say this. But you'll be amazed at how people, people like to give their opinions. When you ask people, are you spiritual? They like to tell you, yeah, I am. Well, what does that mean to you? And then they'll, they'll tell you what that means to them. Don't say, well, that's stupid. That's so foolish. No, you just let them share this with you. And then... This whole business of asking questions opens up their heart. It allows the Spirit of God to work. We said it's like a, a thermometer that you stick into a, a roasted meat to see, are they ready? Has God brought them to the place where they're open to a witness of the testimony of Christ? The L in salt, we said, stands for just listen to them. And then the T in salt reminds us to do everything we can to turn conversations to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the person of Christ himself. We begin with, do you have any spiritual belief? Just listen to what they say. Question number two, we covered last week again. To you, who is Jesus? 
You're not coming at them with a bunch of information you're trying to cram down their throat. Well, don't you know Jesus is this and Jesus is that and he's deity and all those things, which to most of them don't mean anything. You just want to find out, is there any knowledge there at all of who Jesus is? What do they think about Jesus? Oh, he's a good teacher, he's this, he's that. And you're, you're going to want to jump in there and say, no, he's more than a teacher. No, just be silent. Listen to them. You don't want to condemn them. You don't want to jump all over them. You just need to ask them, to you, who is Jesus? This is an important question. And give them time to think about it. Because as they think about it, there's a whole lot more going through in their heads. Have you ever had that happen to you than what's coming out of your mouth? As the Spirit of God begins to remind them of things they've heard about Jesus, maybe in a vacation Bible school years ago, or some verse they've heard on the radio that day, who knows what it is that God's going to use at that moment. But just let them answer the question. Give their response. Question number three. This is the one that some people have trouble asking. <laughs> I'm not sure why. I guess because in our society, we don't think it's even polite to talk about it. But ask them the simple question, do you believe in heaven and hell? It's a legitimate question. Again, you're not trying to force your opinion of what heaven is and hell is. You're just, just asking them, do you believe in heaven or hell? Why? Because I want to find out, do they have anything in there that God's going to use to Kind of bring conviction to the heart. Yeah, I believe there's heaven. I believe there's a hell. It's going to make them be thinking, but how do I get there? Why do people go to hell? All those kinds of things that God can use in their hearts to, to, to bring them to the place where they're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't leave it out. Neither should we. Be bold enough to ask the question, do you believe in heaven or hell? And just again, what do we do? We listen. We've asked the question, we listen to their response and what they're saying. And all the time, what do you do? You're gaining information. You know whether they know anything about the gospel or they don't. You know what they believe about what the Bible says or they don't know what the Bible says. So you're just gathering information. When you talk about do you believe in heaven or hell, that requires a, a mental response. Just what do they know? The next question penetrates a little deeper. If you died right now, gotta stay here. If you died right now, where would you go? Bev, if I asked you that question tonight, you have an answer, right? If you died right now, where would you go? Go to heaven. So he has an answer. And there's, there's only one or two answers to that question, right? They can't wander off over here, wander off over here, it's just, Yes or no? Yes, I believe in heaven and hell. No, I don't believe in heaven and hell. They can say, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. What do you do? You just, again, listen to them. But you can also add this question. If they say, yes, I believe in heaven, I would say this. Why would God let you into his heaven? Just want them to be thinking about this, right? Why does anybody have the opportunity to get into heaven? And so we're asking these questions of these people and bringing it constantly before them, just opening them their heart to additional truth, seeing is there any hunger there? They may say, well, I don't know, but they may say, would you, could you tell me? <laughs> right? That means you got somebody that's nibbling at the hook of the gospel that may very well be open. That gives a good indication. They're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Question number five is this. If what you believe were not true, they may have told you some nonsense that you've heard and listened to, and, and, and you've taken it in, you've listened. If it were not true, would you want to know? If it were not true, what you believe were not true, would you want to know? There's only two responses to that question, aren't there? What are they? Yes, no. Now in a lot of cases, people are, one thing with people, they're always afraid there's something they might not know 
that they need to factor in. So a lot of times they say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know. But you will get people who say, no. I'm happy in my ignorance. They're not going to say it that way, but, but they are saying that. No. What do you do when people say no? You just stay silent. It's amazing the conversation that is generated by your silence. Because there's a conversation going on in their heads. I've even had a couple of situations where I've waited maybe for about 20 seconds, and that seems like 20 minutes, right? And I'll turn and start to walk away. I've never had anybody not say, well, aren't you going to tell me? And I just turn back, I smile at them and say, well, you said no, you didn't want to know. <laughs> and they will say, okay, tell me. And that's your go-ahead to say, okay, God's brought me to the place where he at least is going to give me some opportunity to bring some scripture into their hearts, into their lives that they have to wrestle with. And, and, and it's crucial at this point that you, you ask that question about heaven and hell. It's crucial that you ask the point, if what you believe were wrong would you want to know? You're not telling them everything you believe is wrong and you need to listen to this. You're, you're letting them respond to it. You're not cramming things down their throats again. And one of the good things I like about this method of sharing the gospel is that too often I've met people that somebody else got there first. And when they wouldn't listen to the gospel, somebody just told them, well, if you're not willing to listen, you're just going straight to hell. They really left the door open for me to come along and share the gospel, didn't they? If we get angry with them, all we do is close the door further in their lives. We nail it shut. What we need to do is constantly be realizing this. God's the one that brings opportunities to hear the gospel into their lives. Do you know this? The statistics tell us the average person takes 7.6 times of hearing the gospel before they'll respond to that gospel. You don't know if you're going to be the first one, the second one, the seventh one, the eighth one, sometimes the tenth one, because if that's the average, some need a little less, some need a little more. Your responsibility is in your sharing with them the gospel you leave the door open if you don't get to lead them to Christ, if you don't get to see them make that decision for Christ, leave the door open for somebody else later on. That next opportunity might be you again. If it's a family member or something, it might be somebody else, but please leave the door open. Don't nail it shut so they never want to hear the gospel again. As you Come to those people and you're trying to let the gospel speak into their hearts and their lives. There are seven verses here that allow the Bible to speak that you can use powerfully and effectively that we're going to walk through a, a little bit tonight. But sometimes you find this, people are open until you open your Bible. And for whatever reason, the Bible makes some people nervous. And again, you want to do everything you can to put them at ease. Some people will look at you and say, huh, that's a Bible, isn't it? Yeah, it's a Bible. Well, I've heard the Bible is full of errors. How do you deal with that? What's your response in that situation? The Bible's full of errors. I, I just take my Bible. I was with a guy on an airplane said that to me. I just took my Bible and I said, here, would you show me one? He admitted... He didn't know what they were. He just heard that there were errors in the Bible. It's full of errors. And I said, yeah, I've heard that too, but I've been studying it now for 50 years. I haven't found any yet. But you know, it says here in Romans 3.23, right? I just, remember, what's your goal? To get to the Word, to get the Word into their lives. Don't let them sidetrack you with that. I've had other people say, well, there's so many translations of the Scriptures. How do we know which one is true? How do you answer that? How do you keep that from getting you sidetracked? 
I just say, you know, it's true. There's all kinds of translations. There's the King James Version, the New King James Version. There's the New International Version. There's the English Standard Version. There's the Christian Standard Version. There's, there's the New Living Translation. There's all kinds of them. But you know what I've discovered? That all of all Christian versions, and I always use the word Christian because there's some out there that aren't Christian versions. All Christian versions have, do you know, did you know this, that all Christian versions are basically saying the same thing? No, I didn't know that. I said, I didn't know that for a long time either, but I found that out. And I said, let's go to the Word. <laughs> let's see what the Bible has to say. And as you come to the Scriptures, what I want you to do, you can't see this, I understand that. I don't generally, unless I'm in my office, I generally don't use this Bible because it's so marked up. When I open it up, all I can see is red lines and highlights and all that kind of stuff. I generally try not to use that. Get a Bible. Even better, get yourself just a New Testament that you can carry around easily. And what I've done with this particular Bible is the Christian Standard Version put out by Holman's. And the first verse you're going to share is Romans 3.23. Highlight that in your Bible. Why highlight it? Because when I take that, I sit across at my desk or something from somebody. Generally, I'm putting it across like this to them. They're going to read the Bible. They don't know what Romans 3.23 means in a lot of cases. But if I highlight it, where do their eyes go? They go right where the highlight is. And I, sometimes I'll just say, you see where it's highlighted there? Would you just read that? Did you hear what I said? Would you what? Would you read that? And would you read it out loud? I don't know what it is, but there's something about reading it themselves and reading it out loud that makes it stick better in their minds. And that's the purpose, to get the word into their lives. Don't quote it for them. Somebody quotes you a verse, and I asked you two minutes later what it said. Would you remember it? Not a chance. Just not going to happen. But they're reading it for themselves. They can read it as slowly as they like. And I've never had anybody refuse to read it. When we got to this point, never had anybody refuse to read Romans 3.23, where it says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a very simple verse. Well, what do you do at that point? You ask another question. And the question is this. What does that verse say to you? It's not a right and wrong here. It's just what does that verse say to you? And most people can figure out it says all have sin. And they come short of the glory of God. So you've got that verse in their heart. Who's going to use that verse? Spirit of God. He's there. He's beginning that process of conviction. Oh, all have sinned. All includes, I don't need to even point this out to them. They understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, something else I did in my Bible, right up here, only upside down, from what they're seeing, I just put Romans 6.23, because that's my next verse that I'm going to go to. And then I went over to Romans 6.23, I highlighted Romans 6.23, and up on the top here again, so I can read it from my direction, I put down the next verse that I I'm going to turn to and have them read. Why do that? Because sometimes you're a little nervous, and, and, and you'll get these blank spots. you get those in your mind? You know, I still get them. I don't have to worry. I won't know where to go with this. You write it down. You can look down there if you can't remember what the next verse is then. Just say, okay, let's, you take the Bible back, you turn it over to Romans 6.23, and you flip it over and say, okay, read Romans 6.23. Right? For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ that loved us and, and all that. So we're going to just do it that way. Do that with each verse in your Bible, because a lot of people have said to me in the past, 
Pastor, I could never memorize all these verses. You don't have to memorize anything. The only thing you need to know is go to Romans 3.23 when you get to this end of the questions. And, and, and if you can't remember that, you've got this little sheet of paper, right? You've got the five questions. Keep that somewhere, inside that little Bible or in your wallet or purse or whatever. So you've got the five questions. And people won't mind. I found this out. They don't mind if you've got to look at your, your list and read the next question. They're not offended by that. There are no statistics say that if you've got it all memorized, you're more likely to lead them to Christ. It is far better to get them to read it for themselves. When you go to Romans 6.23, do you read the verse? No. Who reads the verse? They do. Let them read it. And what's the question? What does this verse say to you? Well, it says the wages of sin is death. Now, I do another thing in my Bible at that point. You see, the wages of sin. Circle the word sin. Because that will draw their attention to it. They won't miss it that way. Use a red ink or something that's going to catch them. But, but mark in your Bible... And circle the word sin, for the wages of sin. And you can just point out something simple there, like this. Do you notice it says sin, not sins, plural? Because one sin is sufficient to keep you out of God's heaven, because God requires perfection. That's all you need to say. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Right over the word death, I write the word hell. Because I want them to connect that to die in my sin without Christ, I'm going to go where? I'm going to go to hell. We've already asked them the question. We know whether they believe in heaven or hell or not. I'm going to let God use that to work in their hearts as I share the scripture with them, as, 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 as I let them read it aloud for themselves and trust God to do the work. If I do the work and they trust Christ for my sake. I found out it doesn't work very well. They don't last very long. But I found the people that God brings to himself. That the spirit of God has brought conviction into their heart. I've seen those people go on and gloriously be saved. I think of James that gave his testimony there. Or, or talked to me a bit this morning. And thanked me for and having some part in his life. I used that with James. It worked in his life. God gloriously has saved him, and, and I thank God for that. So we're just going through the verses. We're letting them read the verse. We're letting God convict them through that, think it through, and don't be afraid to mark up your Bible a little bit. Highlight it. Circle certain words that you want to catch their attention as you go down through the different verses. Uh, let me just say in the third verse that you go to Romans 5, 6, and 8. Uh, some copies I've found of this say, have them go to, to uh, John 3, 3, that you must be born again, and you, if you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven, and so on. Some people use that verse there. I like Romans 5. One, you stay in the same book. You don't have to flip. And I, I like what it says there. And if you go to Romans chapter 5, Verses 6 and 8, where it says, For while we were still helpless, while we were still sinners, in the New King James says, At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8 says, But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the margin of my Bible there, I put a cross because I want them to connect with Christ's death, what? The cross. Where did he die? He died on the cross. I also put a little X beside the cross, just a tiny little X, because it reminds me of this. The question here is not, what does this say? But I, I ask them this question, why did Christ die? I want them to begin to understand. I want them to begin to think about, why did Christ die on the cross? You know, I can testify from growing up in church and I heard about, you know, the cross and we celebrated Easter and all that stuff. Wasn't a church that preached the gospel. You can hear all of that 
without ever understanding why did Christ die. So we want to raise the question, why did Christ die? Well, it says here, Christ died for who? He died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, but because he loved us, as we said this morning, and was willing to give himself for us on that glorious cross at Calvary. And so we're, we're bringing them along gently and yet powerfully through the scriptures. They're reading it out loud. It's having an imprint upon their own minds, their own hearts. We've drawn their attention to the word death as the penalty for sin, that there is sin, that we're all sinners, that there is a heaven and a hell. We've drawn them to... Aren't those the very things that you want these people to know about? That you want them to think about? That you want to bring to their hearts and their minds? So we encourage you to do that. So why did Christ die? He came to die for sin. That's the normal response. That, of course, is the right response. And that Christ's death on the cross was the payment for that sin. And then John 14, 6 is the next verse where it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Remember, you're writing over top of Romans 5, 6, and 8. What verse? John 14, 6. So you know I'm going to go over to John 14, 6 next. You can even cheat a little bit. It's a lot easier to find them. I put these little flaps here just so I can find them quicker. I don't waste a lot of time. It doesn't allow them to get us distracted when, when I do that. And so we go to John 14, 6. And after they've read the verse, what's the question? What does this verse say to you? And it's amazing how the Spirit of God can teach people what that verse says. That Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. you got to come through me if you're going to go to heaven and be with God. And it's amazing how... People that don't even have a whole lot of background in the gospel can begin to grasp these truths because the Spirit of God is bringing it to them. Let the scriptures stand on their own. The next verse that you'll see there, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Always underline, Jesus is Lord. We want to remind them what it is that we need to confess with our mouths. and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I underline that. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So you share those verses. Sometimes I'll bring them on down to verse 13, where it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you just call out. I said, that's prayer. You cry out in prayer. Lord, save me. Whosoever shall call upon him for salvation shall be saved. But you stop. You ask them the question first. What does this verse say to you? One of the things I'll say about this is one of the most difficult things for people to understand, and I struggled with that coming from my church background, to believe that I could be forgiven. I thought I had to do something. I thought I had to do enough goodness to outweigh my badness in order to get into heaven. You'll be surprised how many people have that ingrained in their minds and their hearts. Even pagans in the jungle believe they've got to do something to appease God. What glorious good news it is when you find out you don't have to appease him. He's reached out in his love to you. He's offered his son for you on the cross of Calvary. Christ died for our sins. You may at that point, if you're reading that, just ask them, do any particular sins come to your mind? Why? Because I want to know if the Spirit of God is working here and He's bringing sins to us. I don't jump all over them and say, hey, I know you do this and you do that. And I've had people say, well, right now I'm, I'm an adulterer. I'm into alcoholism. I... I I've got a lot of hatred in my heart for people, for my spouse, whatever, uh, bitterness that's there. Uh, I'm a liar. <laughs> people, it's amazing what they will tell you sometimes, that you don't even sometimes want to know all of this stuff. But it's good to know what? That, that the Spirit of God's at work convicting them that, yes, they are sinners and of particular sins in their life. 
Not just I'm a sinner in general, but they know that there's things that they have done, heinous sins at times. Some people even at that point say, well, but what if I was a murderer? Could God forgive me? How do you respond to that? Bring them back and say, read this verse again. Read it again. What did the verse say? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you will be what? He doesn't say if you haven't done certain things, you can be saved. You can be saved. I sometimes take those people to 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us, uh, or forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can bring those verses in. Again, let them read them themselves. You can use those verses, have them written there somewhere in your Bible to remind you. One of the things at all costs you want to avoid, don't get into an argument. You don't want this conversation where the voices start to rise, the tension rises. I'll be very honest. In most cases where I sense there's a tension rising there, I just kind of back off. A couple of times I've had people say, no, no, I, I, I'm not upset. I still want to talk, and so we'll go back at it. But I'm not going to be the one that brings to that place. We're going to say, you know what? If that's what it means to talk to somebody about Christ, I will never talk to anybody about Christ. I'll close the door at that point to anybody being able to share Christ with them. So I, I will back off purposely, even though I haven't gotten all the way to where I want to get. Why? Because it's not my work. I'm just a page turner. I just turn the pages of the Bible, find the place. I've highlighted it. They've got to read it. The Spirit of God's got to work in their lives. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? But I want to tell you it's powerful. It's powerful. And I, I come from a background when I was first saved, out in Cross Creek, going over out back of Boyce Town, a place called Bloomfield Ridge, and going into homes, and I want to tell you, I was a dog on a bone when I went in there, and I'm sharing the gospel, you're going to trust Christ before I go out of here. So I can put a notch on my gun, got another one down. And sadly, I know I turned some people off to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, don't do that. Don't get involved in the arguments that, that some people will try to distract you with, that Satan wants you to get off into. Don't do that. Uh, in your life. Avoid the arguments. So there's times where you are going to have to use a read it again principle. If they say to you, I don't know what that says, just say kindly, with love, just read it again slowly, think it through, think about what it's saying there, what does it say to you? Because you're not trying to impress them with all your knowledge, you want them to grasp what is the Bible saying. Then 2 Corinthians 5.15 says that Christ died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Can I tell you, that's a tremendous verse to be sharing with people, even if they come to you and say, yes, I want to trust Christ, and they're all ready for it, and you let them trust Christ, but you need to take them to 2 Corinthians 5.15, because the gospel's all about you're no longer living for yourself, it's about living for him, because he's your new Lord and master, isn't he? You need to surrender to him. That's what James said, got him. When I talked about the fact, you've got to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. He's the one that's going to rule and run your life. You're going to live for him. You're going to be freed from things, but you're going to be free to live a life that's pleasing in the sight of God. And begin to stress that with people. But ask them, what does that say to you again when you come to that verse? Just share it with them. And what he's trying to teach them there is not living self-centered lives, but living Christ-centered lives. It's what we want to get them to. The seventh passage there, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where he says, Here am I. Behold, I stand at the door and what? I stand at the door and knock. That's Christ speaking. And I know it's not quite the context of that verse, but I think it fits very well with people, speaks people's hearts. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. What does that verse say to you? And some people say, well, Jesus wants to open the door of my heart. No, that's not what the verse says. It says he knocks at the door of your heart. What does Jesus say there? Jesus says, if any man will open the door. 
What do I want people to see at that point? I want you to see that you have a choice. You have a responsibility at this point. Knowing what you now know from these scriptures, you're at a place where you are either going to leave the door close to the living God, to salvation through Jesus Christ, or you're going to open up your heart's door and you're going to welcome him into your life. That's what it's about. You're going to turn to Christ in repentance and faith. And we walk them through that. Again, it's so effective what God is doing in all of these passages. The very first verse deals with the whole issue of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The second verse deals with the penalty on sin. The wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 6, and 8 deal with what the, what the Savior, Jesus Christ, did about our sin. That Christ died for us. John 14, 6 is the verse that gives hope. It narrows it. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You bring it down to the one door. Right? That's what we're doing. We're giving them some hope. Romans 10, 9 through 11 is telling them that anyone that wants to be saved can be saved because Christ died for sinners. And if you will confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. That's the glorious truth of the gospel. You can be justified and forgiven of your sin. 2 Corinthians 5.15 is talking about now that you're a Christian, you've got a new purpose. You've been living your life for sin and pleasure and self. Now you get to live your life for God. He's your Lord and Master. Revelation 3.20 is the choice verse. You have a choice. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? Will you open your heart to Jesus Christ? That brings us to the point, and we're out of time. I just noticed that. <laughs> where we need to close the deal. That's where those final questions are involved here. If you're a car salesman, <laughs> you spend a few hours with these people, you've gone over prices, you've dickered over models and things they want on the car and they don't want on the car and prices and all that. You've got to bring them down at some point to what? Do you want to buy a car or not? Do you want this car or not? Are you willing to pay this price or not? You've got to close the deal. And that's true when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but just be sure you're not the one that's closing the deal. This is the Spirit of God that's going to close the deal. Again, you use the questions. You have them there before you. Are you a sinner? If they've read Romans 3.23, generally the response will be what? Yeah. Most people know you don't have to beat people over the head with you're a dirty, rotten sinner. They know that. They know they've told lies. They've done this. They've done that. They've stolen something. <laughs> if they don't understand the, they're a sinner, the one verse, because it's not offensive with people, that I just say, you know that the Bible says this, the great commandment that all people break is God says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I ask them the question, have you always loved God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? What's the answer to that question? What's, the que what's your answer to that question tonight? No, I haven't. And it's not offensive, but we've broken the commandments of God. And we've already established if we commit one sin, if we've broken one commandment, we are not worthy to go into heaven. We're just trying to gently convince them. What are they? They're sinners. Second question, do you want forgiveness for your sins? Can't imagine somebody not wanting forgiveness for their sin. But you ask that question, and then you what? You listen. Let them respond. If they say to me, no, I don't want forgiveness. I might ask this question, why? But I'm not going to jump all over them. I'm not going to feed them a whole bunch more information. I'm just going to ask why. Why wouldn't you want forgiveness? If you could be forgiven for your sin. Third question, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again? 
And they might look back at me and say, you know, I don't know enough about this yet. Is that legitimate? I've got, I want to think this through. That's legitimate. It's not your case to say, no, you need to do it right here, right now. What do you say? I'm going to leave you with God. You don't say that out loud. You say it to yourself. And I know the question that haunted me for years was, but what if they never get to hear the gospel again? Who is responsible for whether they get to hear the gospel again or not? God is. I want to leave it in the hands of God. Yes, I'm crying inside and praying, God, please bring them to yourself. But I'm not going to force it on them. And I don't want you forcing it on people. I want you allowing the Spirit of God to work in their hearts. Do you believe that Christ died on the cross for you? Yes or no? Did he rise again? Yes or no? Are you willing to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? That's a big question. Are you turning your life over to the Lord Jesus? I'd like to say more about these tonight. and I may come back to this again, but I'm not, I'm not uh, going to say that because we're not here, or I'm not here next Sunday night to preach. And... Uh, I'll just ask God to guide me in this. And then, this is the question again that you will wrestle with. I don't know why it is, but, but I've had so many Christians tell me, this is the one that they're almost scared to ask. They can ask the other questions, but they wrestle with this. Are you ready to invite Jesus into your life and into your heart? Now, I know there's books out there about not asking Jesus into your heart. Your heart is your inner you. Are you willing to let Christ in? That's all you're asking. And there's only two answers to that. One is what? Yes. The second one is no. No. And there I might ask them, why, why no? And Lord willing, another time we'll get to talk about the response to that. But I'm, I'm going to stop for tonight. Hopefully I've given you enough information. How many of you, you think, I, I could go with what I now know. I could go talk to somebody about Christ. I've got the questions. I've got the scriptures. I know the questions I need to, need to ask afterwards to close the deal. I could share Christ. On the table down here, there's a full sheet that, let me see if I can find it here in my notes. It's called a personal commitment with God to share Jesus. This is between you and God, all right? So I'm letting God work on you tonight. And I'm not going to even read all this for you, but it says things like this, I will no longer be a silent Christian, all right? And there's a place for you to sign it, put a date on it, and keep it as a reminder to you, all right? If you picked one of these up, and you signed it, I want you to take one of the green cards and would you write on that, I, I made my commitment. You can call it a faith promise if you want to God, right? Not to be silent, silent with my faith. I am going to look for opportunities. I'm going to pray for opportunities to share my faith with those that don't know Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to have them handed out if you don't care enough to come and pick one up and sign it, it's probably not going to work anyway. But I think it's just a good reminder that you made this choice. I've got the information. I'm going to use it. And I pray that you will. I really pray you will. Because it'll change your life and it can change hundreds of other people's lives if you will begin to share your faith. Jeremy, would you close in a word of prayer tonight, please?